everybody, and welcome to another episode of Dr. Jill Live, this, uh, at least here in Boulder, Colorado, rainy afternoon. Um, I am delighted to talk to Kasha, Dr. Kasha Kynes today, and I'll introduce her in just a moment. Many, many, many of you out there are dealing with chronic complex illness, and one of the roots of much of the suffering is this virus, Epstein-Barr. And Dr. Kynes has become uh, an expert and a teacher and a trainer in this field. And I'm super excited to pick her brain today. Like I said, in just a moment, I'll introduce her. Um, but in the meantime, you can uh, go watch any previous episodes, YouTube, iTunes, Stitcher, anywhere you see podcasts, and be sure and like, subscribe, and uh, leave a review because that helps us reach more people. Okay, so without further ado, Dr. Kynes is the CEO and founder of EBB Global Institute. She's an authority on recovery therapy for chronic Epstein-Barr author. She's a wellness expert and a highly respected doctor of clinical nutrition. Since 2005, she has built an international reputation as a functional nutritionist from being sought after by John Hopkins University to the groundbreaking Amazon bestseller book, Epstein-Barr Virus Solution. Um, she's developed the not only proven and evidence-based methodology for a complete long-term recovery from EBV, she's been teaching a highly effective EBV, EBV recovery program for people suffering from the virus and provides turnkey trainings for medical doctors and other practitioners. Um, I love that you are an uh, advocate for debunking all the misinformation out there. We're going to dive into some of that. Um, and even you and I had this wonderful dialogue by email before we got started on, you know, what about this? And you said, well, maybe I don't use this. And I, I love this. We're going to pick your brain today. Um, I could say so much more, but I want to get right into it. So first oh. of all, welcome, welcome. Thank you for coming on the show. I am so honored. I am so honored to finally meet you in person. So yes, I am delighted to be here. Yeah, so I always like to start, we all have kind of a journey of how we got into this specific area. Tell us a little bit about your journey into uh, clinical nutrition and then eventually into Epstein-Barr. How did you get to where you're at right now? I'm not a wounded healer, <laughs> <Good for you. laughs> uh, but I had a very different career, very fulfilling. Uh, I moved to the States literally after my 30th birthday, which was 27 years ago from Poland. Um, and because I fell in love. And so after two years, that didn't work. And I was approaching 33 and saying, what do I have to do? What do I want to do when I grow up? I'm in new culture, new home, new life. I literally moved with two suitcases, my guitar, my two hats and my cat. Wow. Wow. <laughs> and cassettes with music and five bags that I saw and that I made with books. That, that's, that was my journey. And so... And so what I came up with was um, naturopathic medicine, just healing. I, I, I read a lot. I listened to a lot of alternative radio, which was from Colorado. Uh -huh. It was that, yeah, that was awesome. It was no, in the nineties. Um, and so I spent my focus time, you know, going, I, I still, I was teaching at the university in my previous career, but I was pursuing prerequisites and one prerequisite to go for ND program at Bastyr I flipped and the segue the second I hit hate blood can't like, what am I doing the bottom line is nutrition is foundational it's groundwork in its medicine so I flipped so I had another year of prerequisites <laughs> yeah it was the best decision. So I did that training master degree and uh, I was lucky enough that I had a choice not to become a dietitian thanks goodness, because now they don't have that choice anymore. Leadership has changed, politics has, has changed. And so um, just like you, you know, on the trajectory, when we commit to clinical practice, and I've been doing this, uh, I've had private practice always, almost 20 years full time. So attention is like piano playing, constantly doing, constantly doing. So, and it probably happened to you, you get more and more complicated cases. Nobody wants to be called this, but that's what we call this. So I apologize to the audience, but complicated cases when you hone in on your skills and you're really good at what you do and you both try your best. You're doing everything that functional medicine says, even before functional medicine was the thing, you know, we were doing the right thing and I would hit the wall Yeah, and we would be frustrated together. And so that's, took me to, you know, I was grabbed by Hopkins and Dr. Mullen was there and he was pioneering SIBO work. So I was, and I fell in love with gastroenterology. I was like, oh, 
So that was exciting. I jumped into that. We worked together a lot, learned a lot about that aspect. And then that carried me through a number of years. But then there's more, you know, you follow the presentation. The yeah. presentations that were coming to me were more, you know, SIBO, autoimmunity, bucket full, mystery, but then also Hashimoto's. It's like one on top of the other, on top of the other, on top yes. of the other. And then um, I was always asking the question, you know, what am I not seeing? And then, because I was the last resort. So if I can't do it, there's a lot of pressure on us. If I can't do it, I'm worried what's going to happen to this person. But then I had a, you know, I had a friend who was out of the blue, completely diagnosed with, ended up and hospitalized with MS. It was one of my best friends six months before I immigrated. Wow. So she fought that battle for, what was it, 15 years? And I was starting my life, like parallel lives. I'll never forget the last call for Christmas I made when I could no longer understand what he was saying. So her son had to take over. And so we lost her eventually, the complications. I never said goodbye. I He was afraid to tell me she was already gone. It was, uh, and I had this hole in my heart and um, always ask the question, why couldn't I help her? What was it? And the CBV was kind of, what? Yes. Her son had heard about that. It's like, but, at, you know, at this point in her life, everything was too late already. And before I was not, you know, when I immigrated, I was not a nutritionist. So it was like, I missed that opportunity, but I always ask why, what could be done and what it is. And I remember asking a colleague who is a medical intuitive. Yeah. Like, I just need to know if this thing, EBV, was a triggering event. Like we had, you know, we both experienced uh, Chernobyl. We were in Poland, very close. Wow. I never had problems with thyroid or anything, but I've been in the sun a lot. You probably know MS and all that. You had an article on MS and I yeah. had an article on MS. There was a study. Uh, so anyway, um, and she said, yes. And then my patients started to ask me about this book. What is your educated opinion on this book? Yeah. First one, second one, third one. It's like I had no life. I was overworked and I was burning out. I was constantly working one on one. But I was I was flying to a conference. So I was like, I'll buy this darn book. I read it on the plane. But when I was sitting on the plane, if I could fall off my chair, I would because these were the stories of the people I couldn't help. And my friend Marlena was like, oh, and this was the medical medium book. It's like, yeah. oh, so I was like, oh, oh, if half of it is true, I'm going home and I'm starting. So that took me through thousands of pages of medical literature. I started with proper testing because med medical literature is very clear on testing. Yeah but testing is misinterpreted and misaligned. It's a hot mess, just like Hashimoto's thyroid testing. Yes. It's a hot mess. So I had to create a, a protocol for testing that is evidence-based and understanding is also tricky because it's not counter, it's counterintuitive. IgM and IgG, you know, it's like, this yes. is where thousands of people fall, fall through the cracks and they spend for many more years trying to figure things out when doctors say it has nothing to do with EBV. Yes. So that the testing was like, and I was, and we started to implement testing for all my community that I was working with at that time. And I started to see the patterns, you know, because patterns are important, not, not one person to, but it's just repeated, repeated, and then more medical literature. And then at that time I was also um, finally I was like pinching myself. Why is not anyone doing this? Like, why is it not on the table? There was no training. Not, there's nothing out right, there. Right. Nothing. And even in our functional circles, this thing, it isn't. No. Talking, right. Like there's very yeah. many people talking about the big. Wow. You know, let's so, stop a moment on testing because I think that's critical. And let's talk yeah. a little bit about the testing. I do testing, but I want to hear your um, take on this and what the evidence kind of shows as far as what panel they really need to do. And what does that mean? Yeah. So I always like to zoom 30,000 miles and also confirm because I have the privilege to work with the baby constantly. I close my one-on-one -on -one practice. This is all I do. Yeah. And you have to be in my program to work with me one-on-one because -on -one, it's a hybrid. 
as a consultant. Yes. So I constantly play this piano. So I see all these patterns and clarity comes, right? Just like you with mold or, you know, um, functional medicine. So, so with, uh, I'll tell, I'll start with a story because people remember those. And, the, and this is a good story. I was training a colleague nutritionist. And she says, I have a classic presentation. I know it's chronic active EBV. Okay, so, but her early antigen is negative because early antigen buds up with reactivation yes. and then yes. a couple of weeks and then it goes. But it doesn't mean that after that you're well. And so the question that you ask is, when did she test that test? January. And then I ask her, you need to ask her, where did she feel like that truck hit her over, you know, the head? When did she really tug? Yeah. Thanksgiving. Because when you tug, you take measures, you sleep, you do something. You, yes. And, you know, so early antigen normalizes and then clinicians are confused. Like, this is you know, nothing there. It's just the, the big two ones, three triple digits, but these are past. They're not relevant and da, da, da. And just to and be then, clear, you're talking VCA, IgG, and nuclear antigen, um, IgG. Yes, correct. the big yes. ones that yes. were tagged for life. Yes, and, you know correct. They're never going to be zero if you have them. It's just not possible. This virus right. has been here for 10 million years. We're all carrying it. Yes. I carried it and I didn't know until I got sick with mold yeah. two years ago. <laughs> so, um, so that's a big one. The IgM, VCA, that is very rarely positive. Yes. Shouldn't be because if right. you look at literature, it only spikes up in the initial infection. That's not the population we see. Right. Some people, a very small percentage, always have it elevated, no matter when they test. And so this is molecular mimicry. This is co-infections. This is a mess. This is like, you. you there's yeah. a bucket. You need to look at under the hood. What else? I love this because that whole IgM thing is often triggered. And sometimes it's an actual total subclass IgM as elevated. And then you see these IgM, yep. right? Because of a toxin or infection trigger. So totally agree. Yes, that is a very good point. If somebody thinks like, you know, it's clear and we have the book, we have the quiz, we have so many resources and people have been reading medical medium. So people are more like, I, uh, you know, it matches my life. Yeah. But then- my numbers maybe are all negative. This is a very good point. I teach that too. You need to test all your total IgG and total IgM antibodies because you may not even be producing anymore. You're so depleted. Yeah. So for example, you have a common variable immune deficiency, which is a IgG deficiency or an IgM deficiency or an IgA. But if you don't have enough of the subclasses, you're never going to mount a response. So you're not going to see it on the exact antibodies to this virus. No, and you know what they say, uh, a good doctor treats a patient, not a lab. Yes, yes. You, you, I, you know, people ask me every day, I get emails about the labs, but I need context. I need to understand your life, your presentation, your medication, you know, your medical history. Yeah, I, I need to see the whole picture to see where the labs fit. Yeah. Um, that's important. The one thing that I don't recommend is PCR. Yeah. Agreed with you. I love this because I'm so aligned. Now let's talk about real quickly presentation because I agree. I'm so always like you have to have the clinical picture plus the labs and then you make a good decision, right? But what would tell it describe the kind of classical presentation of reactivation? I know there's a lot, but give us kind of like what patients might think, might think about this as a etiology if they're experiencing what symptoms? Um, number one, they can have autoimmunity. Mm -hmm. They can say, I don't have any of these symptoms. I just have Hashimoto's. Whoops. <laughs> uh, Hashimoto's, it's a, EBV is one of the driving force, you yes. know, cause of the factor. Uh, the, the very heavy fatigue, the fatigue that people can't explain. Mm -hmm. It's the fatigue when you can drag yourself out of bed to the kitchen, back to the bed and you spend for the day. That's the kind of latent fatigue. That's one. Uh, brain fog. People have concerns with cognitive decline. They can't process. They come to my program confused, exhausted. Sometimes they're pain, sometimes joint pain, sometimes fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, the diagnosis. And then a laundry laundry basket of all kinds of complaints, symptoms, more autoimmune disorders. I mean, it's, yeah, you see the patterns. I'm not easily surprised, but yet still we, 
interstitious cystitis. Yeah. yeah. I had no idea that it could ever be even related. But when you go to studies, that there's some studies, like, mm. how is that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's like I had to stop reading the writing the book because it's like it's such a big fat book. But those times, you know, I kept you reading. Keep finding and, more research, right? I yes, know. Yes, the last thing, the last thing I did was Crohn's and IBD, right? It's like, and you had that story. It's like now, nah. but I've worked with this. Well, why don't I just go to PubMed and just check? Yeah. And I had a couple of studies. It's the same thing about 60, 61 percent, regardless whether it's Crohn's or IBD are triggered by EBV or originally, you know, by the time you have it, I haven't had good luck reverse injuring it, just doing EBV work. Cause that's, that's like too far into it. But, right. and at that point I stopped adding because it's like, I can't deal with this. This is like, it's everywhere. And it really is. <laughs> it really is. And I love, that's why I love talking to you because this is such a common underlying cause. Let's hey everybody. I just stopped by to let you know that my new book unexpected finding resilience through functional medicine, science, and faith is now available for order wherever you purchase books. In this book, I share my own journey of overcoming life-threatening illness and the tools and tips and tricks and hope and resilience I found along the way. This book includes practical advice for things like cancer and Crohn's disease and other autoimmune conditions, infections like Lyme or Epstein-Barr and mold and biotoxin related illness. What I really hope is that as you read this book, you find transformational wisdom for health and healing. If you want to get your own copy, stop by readunexpected.com. There you can also collect your free bonuses. So grab your copy today and begin your own transformational journey through functional medicine in finding resilience. Underlying cause. Let's divert just a moment specifically because you told a story about your dear friend who kind of allowed you to start in this realm. Yeah. And we both wrote recently about the very large study that was association of MS and EBV. Do you want to talk yeah. just a little bit about that and what? Yeah, they- yeah, I was. Um, so I was a little bit uneasy about the study. The study had a couple of weaknesses, and I addressed that in the blog. I have an extensive blog. We will link that if you're listening here, wherever you're listening, I'll be sure and link that blog here too. So Thank you. I know you wrote about it, but I, I had to say the, the message is when you have EBV, it doesn't mean you're going to develop mess. Yes. Yes. Uh, some of the trigger points, like I was always in the sun. I grew up in Poland on the Baltic uh, Sea, on the beach, beach town. You know, I love being around. My mother would throw me out naked with a kid, like a little infant. But vitamin D is critical. Yeah. I don't know that Marlena had that when she was growing up, that maybe the different, you know, it's like there yeah. are certain very important things that trigger uh, MS, EBV. And some scientists say, you know, EBV is a prerequisite. You can't get it without EBV. Uh, but there's heavy metal toxicity. There's a lot of things in MS. We can't just say a blanket statement. Yeah. Uh, well, so again, I couldn't agree more because it's always multifactorial. Yeah. It's like toxic load and infectious burden. And those two things play together to create. And, and Epstein-Barr is definitely, as you said, is a driver of autoimmunity. But if you yeah. just had Epstein-Barr in a perfect clean lifestyle with all the right nutrients, you might not develop autoimmunity. So it's not a guarantee either. You said a very good thing. If you have clean diet, great nutrients, you will not have EBV because EBV is an opportunist. Yes. All you need is a drop in your nutritional status. When does it come? When you're stressed, you don't sleep, you overwork, you overgive, you overextend yourself, you cut corners. And when you're stressed, you don't eat well. So it's like double whammy. During stress, you know, we ooze nutrients left and right. Magnesium goes and goes, immunity goes. We are so compromised and the virus goes, oh. And then just one junk meal you yeah. can increase your NF kappa B by 150% for two hours. And then NF kappa B is an inflammatory protein that is like a taxi for mm-hmm. EBV. It hijacks it, uses it to replicate. So it's like we groundwork. Yeah. Honor your boundaries, your, your soul, who you are. Don't overwork. Don't say yes. When you mean no, you need to say no. And I feel like the patterns in our community, at least we have a joke. It's welcome to the 
overachiever, overgiver, perfectionist, anonymous international club. Yeah. We work on creating awareness of how much empathy that community has. Yeah. How much more sensitive they are to other people and energies. And how much more aware they have to be of that protective bubble of their own personal energy so they're not invaded. How much more sensitive they are to Wi-Fi technology, mold exposure, like canaries in the in the mind. And for me, that community, our community is beautiful because these are the most feeling people. These yeah. are the healers. But they get hit with this virus because, you know, it's almost like the body's hitting the wall. You're not, you're not going where you need to go. You're not listening, you're, you know. And the virus is an opportunist. If you are not, I think, you know, I was so lucky doing always what I love. So my immune system is strong because I, this is like, this is my backbone. Right. I'm always right. happy. I don't have toxic relationships, toxic bosses, you know, it's huge and people underestimate it. No, I love that you started there because actually that's such a critical, I find some of the most important healing comes from those healthy boundaries, the loving ourselves, the giving, but also keeping, you know, protecting, yeah. taking care of ourselves. And this makes so much sense. And you and I had a little discussion email before we did this as well with, because I said one of these ingredients, we'll, we'll talk about treatments that I liked is actually probably treating another opportunist, which is fungal or yeast infections, because that also <laughs> often coexist in someone who's in a weakened yeah. state. I always say yeast is opportunistic. Well, EBV is the same, which means yeah. opportunistic just means takes advantage of you in a weakened state. And just yeah. like we said, everybody has these old viruses. EBV is one, it's a big one, but most of yeah. us have varicella, chickenpox. Many of some people have CMV. Uh, yeah. Many people have Borrelia or Lyme disease and not everybody is ill from these things. But when mm -hmm. that immune system bar drops, all of a sudden we don't have the resources to keep them at bay. And that's what you and I are talking about. Yeah, exactly. And think about it, as they say, if you break a leg, uh, you can heal it. But when you break the spirit, that's it. Yeah. And a lot of people in our community have gone through trauma, have been yes. betrayed or have had so much stress, lost two family members in yes. a day or, you know, yes. it's just repeated story. Right. And then yes. and then on top of that, the way we build houses in this country. Yes. It's like breeding ground for I know. <laughs> water damage, like oh. food, plaster. We well, let's build. talk briefly about that because we talked before again about the connection because, of course, I love not that I love mold, but I treat a lot of people with mold. So talk, tell us about that connection because that's important. If someone's walking around, they maybe had a mono, had EBV in the past, they're doing okay, but then they get into a water damage building or a mold exposure, how might that reactivate or cause problems as well? We don't know, but it does mm -hmm. because... Um, I would say, you know, I always say if somebody comes and they have more both, and we know they have both EBV and mold, chances are the EBV is there before or because yeah. of mold, priority is mold. Yes. And priority is delusion is solution. Get out of there or get it out, sell that, whatever you need to do. Yeah. Whatever else you do is secondary and EBV, good luck to you. Yeah. So when I have a predictable protocol, initially, like immediately, a core protocol, I watch it because I know what it delivers because it's evidence-based. And so if we stumble with it, we need to look at other things. Yes. And mold is the biggest one that gets in the way. Wi-Fi too. If you have mold and Wi-Fi, yes. Yes. mold becomes mycotoxins make uh, many more toxins that are more aggressive. We don't know if it's because they're happy or they're threatened. <laughs> uh, we don't need to know. The bottom line is mold can trigger autoimmunity and all kinds of stuff. So you can have Hashimoto's as well, which is very common and, and misdiagnosed because of mold. Yes, yes. Now, again, and I'm glad that we're talking about this because it's so multi-layered. And like you said, mold is, we know mycophenolic acid, which is a common uh, mycotoxin produced by mold is actually used as a drug called cell set to suppress immune system. So we know what happens is those exposures weaken immune system, which we just got ta talking is the framework for this virus to pop itself up. And I agree with you. You always treat the mold first and then go to the viral level. So let's- Yeah, and, and then, sorry, because you mentioned candida. Like if you yeah. have if you have mold exposure current, your candida will start colonizing. Yes. And yeah. so you want to take organic acid tests, look at arabinose, but also look at oxalate level. Mm -hmm. But then the oxalate level, people get confused and change the diet to low carb because they think I can't eat oxalate. And said, so, no, this is just mold. 
And, you know, it's nice I had to go through it and I, I am approved that. <laughs> no, don't restrict. Gotcha. I love this. And again, you started <laughs> out with Dr. Mullins and nutrition. So, you know, as well as I do, when I see those oxalates on there, and I want to actually bring this point home because it's, we're so aligned. Yeah. It's not a problem with the dietary oxalates that adds to the load, but that's not your issue. It's production from internal sources like fungal or metabolites right. and mold. And you have to take care of the root versus just because yeah. oxalates are really good foods. They're almonds and blueberries and spinach. And <laughs> you take out those <laughs> foods, you're losing the nutrients. So I Thank love you. that store. So yeah. yeah. I, I really feel like that's why I moved away from functional medicine because I really feel that it's going into a rabbit hole and really the, the common sense is being lost upon yeah. practitioners. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you have to really look at the whole yeah. picture. Yeah. Yeah. Good yeah, for yeah. you. Cause I, I just couldn't agree more. So let's actually shift then to you've got some science-based protocols that work. And we, we, I'd love for you to share a little bit about what, how someone would go about um, mm -hmm. testing or say they already know that they do have reactivation. Where, what direction do you go once you find out you have reactivation as a part of your clinical picture? So uh, first of all, the supplement protocol doesn't fix EBV. Everybody wants, give me supplements and I'll be fine. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> They will create a foundation and then you really have to revisit what you've been doing, like with your life, what, with your thoughts, with your water, with your food, because EBV is a reflection of environmental toxins as well. Yes. So you have, you know, you have to address all that, but the, the core is the core is so, so I'll tell you what I don't do. And we had that conversation about monolar and lower side, and I don't like to kill yeah. Yeah. You would have to go to Germany or Italy, have the whole blood removed, replaced, come back home, and then you will get blood transfusion and get infected again. Right. We live with this virus. Yeah. We cohabit. Yes. So don't think about killing it, getting rid of it. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Yeah. But what will happen is it creates a lot of oxidative stress, free radical damage. And I found in medical literature that the best, I, I, I collected the stellar like multitaskers, the superstars. They really like, they are nutrient based. It's a nutrient. It has multiple functions. So it builds you up like brick walls of a house. Amino acid, antioxidant, uh, vitamin, mineral. They also are antioxidants, minerals, vitamins, and they have specific uh, uh, anti-EBV activities that they perform, studied. Yeah. And then on top of that, you have to drive them up to a dose that is therapeutic and it's high, aggressive. So I have to be very careful. And the hardest part writing the book for me was having <laughs> a fear that people will do overdo it because more is better. She says right. this, I'm going to do even more. Yeah. Or do it for five years or, you know, hurt themselves. It's like, it was really hard to write that book because I had to, I promised everyone I would do that, like the supplements, doses. So, you know, counterindications, working with the practitioners, how high have I, can I go? So when, and, and I don't like combination supplements, mm -hmm. combinations of hydrochloric acid and enzymes, combinations of antivirals, combinations like that, because you need to know how each one modulates yeah. you separately sometimes people have bottleneck effect with nac they over methylate yeah. they can yeah. so they have to drive nac by itself mm -hmm. see how far they can go or they can mm -hmm. sleep at night or, so when we do that initial protocol i give them like one two months like especially if you have uh, a gene snitch when you don't process you know metabolize supplements very fast or you know just one at a time increase each day Set the foundation because that will actually help you prevent reactivations in future. When you create the protocol that is actually working now, in future, you will be able to turn this off within 48 hours when you have reactivation. Even more, you're going to be so educated, you will know when to expect reactivation. You will know exactly why you're starting to reactivate. You're going to know your symptoms of first, like, oh, you're going to run for that initial protocol again, and it's going to turn it off within 48 hours. Yeah. So this is like, so 
this is how I finally figured out logistics of how to get a person through the process. So they are five years from now, they're living their life. They know what to do. When shit hits the fan, pardon my language, but life happens. They immediately get on this initial, you know, hardcore, high uh, aggressive protocol. So the virus doesn't even reactivate. So the protocol is, you know, selenium is one of those. Mm -hmm. I go all the way up to 800. Don't recommend doing it on your own uh, because any, any, anything above 800, you're going to have toxicity symptom. Mm -hmm. I, <laughs> one of our students recently, she wrote the names of the supplements and dosages on the caps, you know, on the tops. Yeah. Because they have brain fog, they can't remember. Right, right. But she wrote it wrong. Oh and no! She tells me, you know, I'm on the I'm on the bundle, and I am feeling crappy. I don't know something's going on, and something was mentioned about saying, "Wait a second, what about the selenium? How much are you thinking?" She was overdoing it, so she had like rickets symptoms, and so yeah, I'm not rickets with selenium. Yeah, that's not rickets. Uh, I was talking about thinking about vitamin D, but anyway, you have to be careful. Work with a clinician. Mm -hmm. The book has contraindications, you know, the book has and kind you of- will, just so everybody knows if you're listening, we're going to put links to your training course and your book. So if you want to really get in, this is just a teaser, kind of the intro, you, you definitely have the training um, for those who want to dive deeper and we'll link to that. But you said selenium, what else after so, selenium? Selenium, uh, high NAC, mm -hmm. high lysine, um, zinc, you need zinc every day. So it needs to be with a little bit of copper. Yeah. Um, and then vitamin C with bioflavonoids, because that's really is like it extends it le longer. Uh, there should be a vitamin D, of course, mm -hmm. and with TK2. And am I missing something? Uh, there should be eight. Licorice is the only botanical. Okay. So it's not a nutrient based one, but it's worth it because it. Yeah. it, it and you that's that, when I think of licorice, I think of adrenals, cortisol as a oh, yeah. puzzle. And is that one way that you're using it to kind of support the adrenals and that? And yes. we know, like you said, the thyroid and adrenal glands can literally be um, attacked by this virus. In yeah. Effect. So there's yeah. So uh, the adrenal insufficiency is is comes. You know, this is something in our community that is always present. I don't see normal thyroid function and no more yes, adrenal function. Yes, agreed. I agree. It's kind of like- Yeah, so thing. that licorice is perfect because it just lifts yeah. those adrenals, gives you a little oomph. Like, and they typically have the blood pressure drops too low and people are just- oh. So that kind of pumps it without coughing. Um, yeah. And that's why when the stress impacts your body, it also impacts your thyroid, like you said. Mm -hmm. And the thyroid is the one that decides how you secrete your stomach acid. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes the stomach acid starts yeah. go dropping. And so you become more sticky for infections, mm -hmm. co-infections, yeah. overgrowth, candida, yeah. yes. bacillus, and this and that, strep stuff, <laughs> Ace pylori. <laughs> so we have to look at the whole person. Yeah. No, so I this love is not, ladies and gentlemen, it's not just a quick fix. Let's get those darn supplements and off mm -hmm. we go and do the same thing we were doing. You have to, it's kind of like an aha place in your life. It is in a way, it's like a lot of things, but I love that you're focusing on this because so many illnesses, so many things are a wake up call for us to actually start paying attention to how we're living, how we're showing up. Like you said, our boundaries, our relationships. And I love that you kind of started with that framework of this is a call for any of you suffering from this, not yeah. to just grab a bunch of supplements and keep going just like you're doing, but to actually, and especially like you said, in our country, it's such a productivity driven, uh, like don't rest, don't take time off, don't take care of yourself. And this is a perfect um, wake up call for really taking those things seriously in your life. Yeah. And it's difficult because Americans work more than Japanese people. I mean, that's like, Oh yeah. And, um, <laughs> grew up in Poland. We had, we had summers, we had that everything was low key. There was no pressure, you know, nobody made a lot of money. We were just happier. Like, and I've been pretty much working yeah. Here nonstop. I love it, but still you got sucked into the culture. Didn't you? I got sucked. So I am, I am, slowing down right now uh, volunteering yeah. and doing other things and 
being very selective about medical yeah. conferences. I don't want to travel go to the conference anymore. So it is hard for Americans because uh, life here is complicated, lots of pressure, lots of complexities, aging parents with yeah. cognitive deterioration. There's like all these things. Oh my, right. And at a certain point in your life, you have, as a woman in particular, you have those aging parents the complication you mm-hmm. have your old term spouse that may be complicated the kids are going to college that is complicated expensive it's like you know it's like you don't even you're juggling, your, you're juggling job or pets or whatever else so again, you don't I, even have any doubt you don't have your own personal dreams like it's it's you're just con- constantly on a on a go so it's difficult yeah gosh and I, again this is such a great um, it's one of those things where we often think of suffering or illness or something that stops our ability to perform and work as a real negative, right? But what you're doing is framing it as what if the EBV in your life, the fatigue that you're suffering is actually a wake up for you to change and shift and become the person show up as you've always wanted to show up. And I really like that yeah. framework because I always yeah. think illness, it's never fun. I've been through cancer and Crohn's disease and mold related illness, and I've had ABB and it's so, I mean, I feel having a control, but it's absolutely something I've experienced, but what's happened in each one of these things is it shifted how I see life, how I show up. And I'm still in the process, still working at not working too hard, but it's so important to view these things. Yeah as maybe an awakening versus just something that happens to us. Yeah. And I don't know how you did it because I find I'm not a very good patient myself. <laughs> I know. I'm totally. Yeah, exactly. I, I do have good news though, yeah. because, um, and this is something I feel like clinical nutritionists are undervalued. People don't understand what we do in our perspective, but I, I really like after 20 years of looking at everything and, you know, and looking at my body and how it's handled everything and how I handled it. I will repeat what I've heard for many years that up to 80% of chronic illness is caused by nutritional deficiencies. And it still stands. Yes. Because basically what I'm doing with EBV is I'm building people up nutritionally. We focus on quality foods, quality nutrients, absorption, um, and decreasing the toxicity level on different levels so those nutrients can be better utilized rather than doing damage control constantly and the thing is so this is like i want to impress it on 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 the audience today so you don't feel really discouraged the good news is that the body is infinitely intelligent if we can get out of the way if we can only provide what it needs at the right times right combinations the i mean you know if you just do that Immunologists forget immune cells require amino acids, nutrients, magnesium. They, they require nutrients, darn it. They do. Yes. Yes. You have oh. a weak immune system, support it. Yeah. You know, we have studied fiber. You need stool. You yeah. know, if you have fiber, you're going to create short chain fatty acids. They will be used by T Rex, like the Superman of immune cells. Yes. No Calm fiber. down that autoimmune reactivity, right? Like 17, TH17. Yeah, yeah. They can have... yep. yeah exactly. so this is what I have to teach because people have no idea. They're looking for the next, you know, the next vaccination, the next study. It's like, there's no magic. We have it in our hands. And I have to impress on everybody. I see people recover and live their dreams every day. And mm-hmm. it's just the most amazing feeling. And you do the, you, too, you do too. I just, I just see it with EBV. So I have to say, it's totally possible. It's your birthright to be well. You just don't know. So now you know. So now you can do something about it and not go into the rabbit hole of the whole medical structure that is failing us uh, and be your own advocate so you can get the proper testing. By the way, there are consumer direct labs that will do proper testing for EBV. I'm not kidding you. I have people for seven years, they've been trying to find a doctor who will agree to test it because they say, no, nothing yet that can be done. I'm not going to do it. It's not going to tell you anything. That's life spent uselessly. So there are a lot of resources there. It's it's all doable. It's all doable. 
And now more than ever, like you said, patients have the ability to get the labs, to get the nutrients, to kind of do yes. some of this. So you have more freedom than you think. Yes. You just keep going. Don't, you know, find, find doctors that will be on your team. Amazing. And, and people like you who are out there teaching. So you've got the book. I want to make sure people know about that. What's the title and where can they find your book? The EBV solution. Uh, we have a link. It's uh, on Amazon, but we have a link. We have links to everything on our website. We created a resource website, EBV help, H E L P, basically. EBV help. So EBV com is your website. Yeah. 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 Everything is there. We have workshops. We have free workshops, 47 box workshops. We have more spiritual workshops, food workshops, uh, trainings for doctors, trainings for people that are sick. Um, we have, uh, the website has a lot of information about understanding your labs. So all oh. that information, there's a video there, all kinds of scenarios, all of that is there. There's a link to the book. Uh, so yeah, we try to make sure that if somebody Googles EBV, they don't go into a rabbit hole and really right. viral, they get, you know, this is what it is. Uh, and by the way, we have summer and wildfires. I just want to address, uh, yes, let's talk about that at the end here. Yes, July 4th, if you have EBV, if you're not well, you cannot inhale the air from fireworks. You cannot sit by pit fire when the wood is burning, when the when the wind blows the smoke on you. You should not be grilling when this, you're inhaling the smoke. And the, the wildfires, you can't yes. be outside. You have to wear a mask, especially if you have EBV. And then you need a good filter in the house. And definitely supplements for EBV to keep it under control because dioxins and yes. dioxins after there were studies from Switzerland, dioxins after fireworks linger for, I think, two weeks in the air. It don't just dissipate. So you're going to have exposure. So we we remind every summer, you know, we send messages. So please share because a lot of people, you may be doing everything right and you're doing better and then you tongue and you really feel derailed and demoralized. It's like, I'm doing everything right. It's not working, but there's always a reason the virus is predictable. Yes. So that would be the reason. And it really helps people understand, okay, this is not a mystery. Right. I love, you're talking my language because of course, wildfires, I'm in Colorado, very, very common. And when this uh, two years ago, one and a half years ago, we had massive, massive wildfires in my community. And what I saw all of a sudden, it was the, the labs of my patients, everybody in this community that I was testing looked just like a severe mold exposure, which is that toxic load in the air, which weakens the immune system. And what I realized is the same kinds of markers, TGF beta and MMP9 were being elevated by the wildfire, the burning of all these toxins and yeah. like you said, the smoke of fireworks. So love yeah. that you're talking about that. And if you're out there and feeling helpless, you can get an air filter in your house. You can do this, this work yourself and then you be very careful yeah. about yeah. exposure. Yeah. Well, Dr. Kynes, Kasha, it has been such a pleasure to talk to you. Um, EBV is, is, mine. <laughs> is where you can find more. And um, so appreciate the work you're doing, not only for patients, but even bringing awareness to practitioners. So thank you again for all the work you're doing in the world. It is my honor. I thank you for doing everything that you are doing. So yes, invite me anytime. We'll talk more. Any support you need. Let's educate people as needed. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you, for thank you so much.